So when I think of muscle memory, I instantly think of the sports science application, which is the performance of sports-specific movements. For example, kicking a football. The more you practice this skill, the more it becomes an automated process. And this is what muscle memory refers to in terms of performance. And you can relate this to all types of sporting actions, for example, shooting a basketball. And this relates to developing motor patterns within the body through this repeated practice and also developing this motor schema, which is a long-term memory of how to perform a movement which is stored in the brain. But in terms of body composition, muscle memory refers to the ability of the body to regain muscle after a period where you have lost muscle. And Dr. Brad Schoenfeld just communicated his interpretation of a very interesting piece of research. And he also gives a very useful idea as to how you may apply muscle memory to specific muscle growth gains. And so I'm Jimmy Fantastic. This is the Shredded Sports Science. David Brent is refreshingly laid back for a man with such responsibility. Hate clickbaits. And so if you are not a subscriber to this channel and you've clicked on this video thinking that Arnold Schwarzenegger is going to give you a one-on-one -on -one interpretation of muscle memory on a channel called Shredded Sports Science with multiple videos with my face in them, you can leave me silly comments, but spoiler alert. You're a f choir boy compared to me. A choir boy. Putting an Arnold Schwarzenegger image from skinny to muscular on the thumbnail is just purely visually hilarious. And the reason that this is so important, this idea of muscle memory, is that training progress is not always linear. It's not always this process of continued success, success upon success, where you're consistently reaching your goals. Actually, in many cases, training and the attainment of health and fitness is not linear. There's going to be peaks and troughs. There's going to be good days and bad days. There may be times when you're not able to train for certain reasons. It could be a tragedy in your family. It could be an injury. It could be some other factor. There are so many reasons. And so it is important as much as we want to develop and promote this idea of a consistency with our training and grinding each day. We also have to be realistic and understand that that may not always be possible. And so that's why I really wanted to make this video. And this idea of muscle memory in practice means that if you are a trained individual and you've already built up muscle through resistance training over time, if there is a period of time where perhaps you are not training and you have lost some muscle mass, you are able to regain it more efficiently. And just to start before I get deeper into muscle memory, some people say, well, muscle memory, this idea that you can regain your muscle mass back more efficiently if, if you're previously trained, means that the idea of use it or lose it does not apply. Now, muscle mass is active tissue. If you're not creating a stimulus on your muscle to maintain or grow, then muscle mass atrophy may occur. It is very much a case of use it or lose it. And actually the concept of muscle memory applies because of the use it or lose it. It follows a period of muscle loss that this muscle memory can come into play. So please don't get confused. Muscle memory does not negate the idea of use it or lose it. That absolutely is valid as muscle mass is active tissue. Your body does not want to store large amounts of muscle mass. Your body wants to operate efficiently. It wants homeostasis. It does not want to burn extra calories so that you can look good on the beach. And that's why even if you are trained, you have to consistently train, consistently challenge your muscle. It's not just a case of building muscle and then breezing down to beach street. And so this idea of muscle memory heavily ties into the nervous system because after all, your nervous system is responsible for bodily movement by stimulating muscle fibers, stimulating muscle for movement and in the form of resistance training to overcome the weight or the stimulus. However, in 2018, Seaborn et al. published a piece of research, which is very important, it's very interesting. Now, there are limitations and further work is needed. But in a nutshell, we, are, we have a growing body of evidence to suggest that muscle memory really 
is a valid concept. But I would start by saying that we do need meta-analysis. We do need this review of many pieces of research to, to give better communication. However, it is also fair to say that we are learning more. And Seaborn et al. is one factor why we do understand more about muscle memory. And so this research contained eight male participants. Now, they were untrained males. However, they did undergo a training period. So they did become trained. Seven weeks of training, of loading, followed by seven weeks of the non-training phase, and then followed by seven weeks of the reloading to see how this muscle memory may operate. And the results were very positive. However, instantly again, you could say, well, in terms of further research, it would be useful to have research on trained individuals who had trained and lifted for many, many years, as that will give us further insight. And it's important to know that these participants did undergo an exercise familiarization week where they learned how to lift using a no or low load. And Seabon et al. found that your muscles become more sensitized following this, this non-training phase. And this is Brad Schoenfeld's interpretation of the study. Study. And he said that specifically clusters of various genes demonstrated the highest expression after reloading. And these changes correlated with increases in lean mass. And so interestingly, Brad puts forward this idea. Now, it's just an idea that perhaps in order to grow muscle in the future, we could consciously program phases of non-training into our programming. As, as this may be beneficial, this has a, an effect at the genetic level which may benefit us in terms of consciously growing more muscle in the future using this concept of muscle memory. Now, it's just an idea and further research, of course, is needed. And so the authors of this research state that these genes were hypomethylated and switched on after the earlier period of load-induced hypertrophy, maintained during unloading due to methylation of these genes remaining low, and then and then upon exposure to a later period of reload-induced hypertrophy, these genes were switched on to an even greater extent. And I understand that sounds a bit confusing. James is going to make it a bit simpler. So the researchers found that genetic changes occurred during this resistance training phase remained during the non-training. And it's then these genes which were switched on during the reloading phase which allowed this more efficient muscle growth using muscle memory. And so essentially, if we are resistance training, we make genetic adaptations, which then remain during these periods of non-training. Now, in terms of length, this research, this research suggests that seven weeks is certainly an accurate time frame. However, beyond that, we don't really know how long these adaptations may last, but it's, again, very interesting. And so if we look at this idea of muscle memory and this ability to regain muscle due to these genetic adaptations we are making through our resistance training, I want to relate that to another concept and principle of training, and that's frequency. Now, the more knowledge you develop, the more you will understand that Ideas and concepts with training overlap and are integrated. And this is great and exciting because it gives you the room to be artistic and manipulate your training to meet your goals. And frequency is one principle of training. Frequency refers to how often you are performing perhaps a specific workout in a specific time frame or hitting a certain muscle group within a specific time frame. For example, how many times are you performing your pushing workout in one week? If you're doing that two times per week, three times per week, that's a good amount of frequency that you are performing that session. Now, when we think of frequency, generally we, we relate it to our goals. So if our goal is muscle growth, the more we're repeating that pushing workout, the more we're able to create the muscle damage within a week using these repeated dynamic contractions, which cause stress on the muscle fibers. However, here is something that people don't tend to think about with frequency. And again, it relates to this idea of developing motor patterns. And it's that the more frequency you have in your training, the more you can become competent with your lifts. I recently made the KSI video, which is fair to say made a wee bit of noise on the old YouTube, and something which you can think about. If there is an exercise that you struggle with execution, now form is a, is a problematic term because exercise execution is very specific to you, your characteristics such as your limb length, also the specific exercise you are performing. There are many variables which influence good form, but certainly for you in a specific scenario, 
there is such a thing as ex good exercise execution. And the more frequently you perform exercises, the more you are training these motor patterns, the more you are creating this automated process, you are memorizing these movements in your brain, this motor schema. And so that's something I want you to just think about as a caveat to end this video. Look at your training. Is there an exercise that you could put more frequently into your training sessions and your programming to improve your competency with that lift, which ultimately could benefit you in many ways? And so are you not entertained? My name is Jimmy Fantastic. This is the Shredded Sports Science. Thank you very much, and I'll see you soon.